join me by turning in your Bibles all the way back to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. So, let's see here. So, what do you call a line of rabbits walking backwards? James, this goes along with what you had to say earlier. A receding hairline. <laughs> yeah, that's the best I could come up with. So, Well, praise the Lord. Have you had a good week? Honestly, honestly, if you've had a good week, raise your hand and say that was me. If you've had a rough week, raise your hand and say that was me. Okay, well, this time it was more, more good than rough. Uh, that's not typical. Uh, no, it is. But, uh, so, I, you know, I showed you my notes last week. This week's really cool, really cool. You can't see it. But it says, you see, can you all see what that is? Glasses of lemonade. Glasses of lemonade. So we're going to talk about making lemonade out of your lemon. Out of your lemons. Y'all have all heard that statement before, right? When things are going hard for you, when we're having a difficult time, what do we need to do? We need to make lemons made out of our lemons and now I can't get my notes back where I can see them properly well that's going to be special <coughs> all right well praise the Lord praise somebody share a testimony something good that God did for you this week something you've experienced this week that's just really been good anybody yeah Right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Soleil, yeah. Oh, amen. Lana. We're very proud of him, too. Yeah. <laughs> Did he? Amen. So hell wasn't so bad after all. I need somebody in here who's good with Microsoft Word. Anybody that can? Come on, are we that illiterate in here? Somebody that can operate Microsoft Word. Can you step up here and fix this for me? It'll be very easy for you, I just think. Wow, we had another testimony over here. Yeah, Dora. Yeah. Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 25 medicines, 25 medications. I, we, when we had the, our drug recovery center, some of these individuals would come in, and they would be on lengthy, uh, just a, a list of different medications. And the medications were causing problems with the medications. And it built and built and built. And we would recommend, you know, hey, first thing you got to do is you come off of everything. And that's terrifying to somebody who has 
been in this for a long time, and the doctors have gradually built up, built up, built up, and they feel totally dependent upon that. But once they come off of it, like Doris did this week, or last week, it's amazing how free they are. So I say that just to say, and we're talking about psychiatric medicines. We're not in depression, anxiety. We're not talking about heart medicine. So don't go home and quit your heart medicine. <laughs> you, you pray that through real hard before you do. Uh, but uh, yeah, so God bless you, and we are with you, and we we support you, and you know we know God is God is for you. Amen. We have been praying for it. So you can't figure it out either. So I don't know how I did it. She doesn't know how I did it. I, I reformatted everything, but that's okay. We're going to get through this. So thank you. Uh, let's give our, our lovely sister a big hand for her. For, uh, well, now it's going nowhere. Hmm. Okay, so let's do this. Get out. Let's close that. Y'all bear with me just a moment. Let's get out of there. Let's close down Google. All the way back to that. All right, so let's see how well I can fake it. Does anybody have a Bible I could use? <laughs> I can use one of those things. All right, good. We don't. We, you know what? I've got my text is on here, so I'm going to go ahead and use that. Hey, you have notes back there. Look at there. I gave them my paper notes. Everybody say, too bad. <laughs> you thought you were out real early, so you will be. So turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. And we're talking about making lemon, lemonade out of our lemons. I was, uh, we've been picking Seth up from work. He's had a new job. He's been, been working and, and uh, while he's uh, getting his funds together to buy a new vehicle. We've been picking him up. And I've noticed as we are waiting on you to get out, the, all the different guys that are, <clears throat> that are leaving. So this is at the new battery plant. And there's a lot of construction workers there. Matter of fact, I guess they're mostly all construction or, or supervision. And they've worked, these guys have worked nine, eight, nine, ten, twelve hour days, and they are really, really exhausted. So I'm sitting there, I park by the gate, and I watch as they come out, and I see some of them come out, and they're just hilarious. They're having fun, they're laughing, they're cutting up. They look like they're so thrilled to be off, you know, to be out, be off of the job. And then another guy will come and or a series of them, and they'll just be very sober. Maybe they're walking by themselves. They're sober. Uh, they don't. They don't look unhappy. It's just they're tired. They're just tired, and you get that. And then there's a rare few that'll come out that are les miserables. That was a movie, Le, Le miserables, or something about miserable people. And you can tell these guys are miserable that they have had a really bad day. And and it may have just been that they're that they're having a bad time. They're going through something in their life, having a bad day. But some people are just sour. Everybody say sour. sour. Some people are just sour. And, and I began to notice that there were some that every day they have the same look on their face. It's like this was the worst day of my life. And we love those special sounds that come from the body. Um, Daisy had some kind of an emergency type situation she had to take care of this morning so the kids are going to be with us i'm going to try to rush through this for everybody's sake so <clears throat> so uh so you see these different guys different opinion and, and as i was watching some of these that are really really unhappy when they come out you can tell they either they hate their job or something's going on in their life that's really hard to deal with they're struggling with something and i thought to myself and i, I said to lori when we were driving off or later on or something i said you know i had this thought and I wasn't thinking about the old saying, when life deals you, lemons make lemonade. I wasn't thinking about that. But that concept came to me, and I thought, you know, to these guys, I thought I'd like to, it's like to say, you just need to learn how to put a little sugar in your lemonade. Uh, lemonade, I, I thought about doing a little illustration, but I thought about the time I was going to have a couple of glasses, one with straight lemonade right out of the squeeze, you know, the bottle you squeeze. Y'all have ever tasted that lemon juice? <laughs> Oh, it's terrible. And uh, have a little bit of that in a glass, and then have a glass that has sweet, nice lemonade, and have two guys come up and try them and compare them. And this guy's saying, that's awful, that's awful. So all you need to do is put two things in it, a little water and a little sugar. And if you'll put water and sugar in that extremely strong, pungent, sour taste, you can make it into something that is very refreshing and enjoyable. 
And as I thought about that, as I have thought about that for the last week, and then began to pray, I've actually got a whole sermon for you. I don't know if I'll just talk or if I would do some of that. But, but as I thought about it, I thought about this. There are two things up front that I'll just throw out at you, that if your life is dealing you a lot of lemons, if things are sour, if you're struggling, if you're battling, if you've got unforgiveness and bitterness in your life, if, you've, if, you've got, if, if, if your world is falling apart, if, you've, if you're facing financial uh, breakdown, and whatever it is, if you're going through something in your life, you hate your job maybe like maybe this guy said, whatever, if you're going through something, there's two things right up front that I want to say that you, you need to learn to do and I need to learn to do to sweeten the sour life that we're dealing with. The first one is you pour water in. And in the Bible, water is representative of the Word of God. It's the Word of God. The water of the Word is what the Scripture literally calls it. So you, need, you, you take this sour experience that you're having. You pour that or you pour over that the Word of God, His Word, what He would say about your circumstance, about your situation, how, how He would instruct you to deal with it. You pour that over it, but then you need to put something a little sweet, a sweetener in there with it. So the word of the word will dilute your bad situation. It'll break it down to where you can begin processing and thinking. Now, here's the problem that we have a lot of times when things are bad for us, when we're going through something. Uh, a lot of times our pro- the reason we don't pull out or we can't seem to deal with it a lot of times is because we won't stop and say, okay, I'm going to analyze this from a proper perspective. It, we might turn inward and get bitter. We might become unforgiving. We might, we might, we might become a person of blame. It's like the stages of, of grief. When you lose someone you love or lose anything, it can cause you to go into a, 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 a time of grief. You can lose, I, I use this example sometimes. If you're sitting at a desk and you're working and you stop and turn around and do something and you come back and you have misplaced your pencil, you lost your pencil, you will grieve over the loss of a pencil. You say, oh, that's stupid. No, it's not. Watch what happens. Grief is this. First, there's denial. Oh, I know I had that pencil right here. You deny the fact that you can actually possibly lose a pencil. <laughs> well, no, I know I had that pencil right here. That's stupid. There's no and then there's, and with, with grief, you'll go from, 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 uh, from denial, you move to anger. Anger is, you just, you, it just comes over you. It's an emotion. It's a natural thing. But you get mad. I can't believe I lost that pencil. You know, you get mad about it. And then the next thing is uh, there's anger. Let's say there, there's denial. There's anger. And the next one is what? Huh? Well, the, I guess that'll be one in there, but it's blame. Blame is next. Somebody took my pencil. You start looking around. Look at the guy next to you. Did you get my pencil? <laughs> so, and with, with the greater the loss, the deeper the grief. And so we understand that. We can go through things that can be so difficult, so hard to deal with, that they just get hard. They're just hard. And so, so we go through, but we can grieve over the loss of anything. And what, what we need to learn to do is how to deal with ourselves when we're going through the loss of something or or when we're going through a battle, we're going through a struggle, how to deal with that. So let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 30. And read this story that hopefully you may already be familiar with. It says, Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, and they had attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. And they didn't kill anybody, but they carried them away, and they went their way with him. So these Amalekite men, these soldiers, came came into the town. Actually, they came into all of south, uh, southern Israel. It wasn't just Zeglag. They came down to southern Israel, and they began to ravish and pillage the the villages and... and, uh, and, they, and taking all the people captive and burning the city. So David and his men were out, and they were doing what David's, King David's did in that day. Uh, he wasn't king yet, but he was leading a band of rebels, men who were mighty warriors, 
and they were not doing bad things. They were going out, they were fighting for the Lord and stuff. But they were spending a lot of time on, in, in battle, on the battlefield, right? And so they're out doing what they do, battling and warring, and they, and they come home, and they find, if you ever read the rest of the story, I'll just talk. And they come home, and they find, when they get home, they find that their city, their town where they were from, Ziklag, has been totally ravished and pillaged and burned to the ground, and all of the people have been taken captive, and they're gone. Now, that includes David's two wives. That was probably his first problem. But David had two wives. <laughs> And they come back, and all of their, their family members, their wives, their kids, their children, everybody's gone. Even the officials of the town, they've all been taken captive, they've all been carried away. Now, you've got to think about David's men. These guys had spent all this time out doing battle. They've been at, they, they go from battle to battle to battle, and, and they're, they're just tough guys. They're beasts. They are beasts. They're, 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 they're massive. They're strong. They're skilled at war. They, you know, they're strong. They're bold-faced. They're confident at what they do, but they're out there sleeping under the sky. Uh, you know, they're catching their prey to eat, to feed themselves. Well, they're just beasts. These guys are beasts. So they come home, they find their city's been, pill uh, and been pillaged, and everything's gone and burned up. And what do you think they do? We're going to go find these guys and kill them, right? That's not what they did. They got off their horses, they dropped to their knees, and they fell apart. <laughs> because even the strongest of the strongest of the strongest human beings have weaknesses and have points and have things that can bring them down. So if you're going through something and it's getting to you and you're thinking, you know, I'm a Christian, not, this is not supposed to be, affect my life like it has. This is not supposed to be so difficult on me. Just know you're just like the rest of us. These soldiers, they got, I can see them walking through. They're, they're going through the, the burned city. They're, they're you know, going through their, their belongings, if anything, looking for anything that might be left, any sign of life, and there's nothing there. And they're literally broken and devastated. And so even, even David, as a matter of fact, it says that he, he was devastated from what had happened. Let me go ahead and read a little more. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and they wept until they had no more power to weep. These guys, these strong men, wept until they were totally emotionally exhausted. Okay? And David's two wives, both of them were taken captive. And now David was greatly distressed. Did somebody say greatly distressed? greatly distressed. That's pretty distressed, right? For the people spoke of stoning him. The people spoke of stoning him. And so, I'm out of order on my notes because of this, but I'm, I'm just going to continue with this and I'm going to jump to something else. But watch this. The people spoke of stoning him because of the soul of all of the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David, and you've probably heard this verse of Scripture before. It's a good one. It says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. That word strengthened in other, tr other translations is encouraged. David is in this circumstance, this situation. And he, the Bible says that even his men were now starting to blame him because they're grieving. And they're going through the same process of denial, anger, blame, all the things that go on. And they begin to blame David. If you hadn't taken us out here to fight these people, if you hadn't led us to do this, we'd have been home. We'd have been able to protect our people, right? And so their souls are distressed and they're grieving. So now they start talking about stone and David. So it's going from bad to worse. What they don't understand is that David is just one of them. He may be the leader, but he's just one of them. Y'all know that it's, 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 uh, it's lonely at the top. <laughs> you know, David was going to have to rise up and take the position that he's going to continue to lead these guys while they're going through what they're going through, all the while he's going through what he's going through. I got a phone call several years ago from an individual in the church who was going through, a, had gone through a surgery, and I was about to go through a surgery, I think is what it was, and was weeping profusely, could, couldn't even hardly talk to me on the phone just crying like a baby. And this was an adult man, 
he was so terrified of what he was about to go through. And uh, it was a serious surgery, it was. And, and he just wept and he cried. And he, Pastor, pray for me, Pastor, pray for me. And he was just pouring his heart out. And so I, you know, I tried to encourage him. I said what things I could, you know, there's only so much you can say when somebody's going through something. Sometimes it's better not to speak, right? But in this event, uh, I was able to encourage him with some things. The Lord gave me some stuff to say to encourage him. Encourage him, and, and he kind of calmed down, and then I was able to lead him in prayer, and we prayed, and the Holy Spirit came and gave him peace. And everybody say amen to that. He not knowing that I don't know how I said anything because I was going through something physical at the same time that was, ju- in, my, in, in my perspective, just as bad, if not worse. I didn't mention a word to him. I didn't say it. He didn't know. He doesn't know to this day that it was all I could do to be there on the phone. I don't know what I said. I don't know how I said it. John, being a police officer, I guarantee you John has been through some of the same things. He, you've had, he's had major surgeries. They've replaced everything but his head. He has, <laughs> you know. But I know you've had times where you're out there doing your job and people don't know that you're going through something as bad or worse than they're going through. But as a leader, you don't get to tell those things. You just have to be strong. I heard a guy preach a sermon one time, and he was talking about football, uh, professional football players. And they say the one thing that distinguishes between who gets to become a pro, a pro and remain a pro from the, all of those who don't get, who never make that, the one thing that, very, that differs between them. I'm talking about between the other guys that are greats. They're greats everywhere, but there are only, only so many greats to get on a team, right? They said the one thing is the ability to play with pain. A true professional can break his ankle and not tell his coach till the game is over, right? That's right. He'll keep playing with pain. Or he'll come in with a broken wrist or broken arm. They'll wrap it up with tape real tight, put a splint on him or whatever, and they say, you're costing us $500,000 for this game if you quit. Get back out there and finish the game. It's the ability to play with pain. And so David had become a leader because he could play with pain but he could play with pain because he had learned where to take his brokenness and his hurt and his disappointment and his physical pain. He knew where to go with that. And so the next verse, after you read about all the bad things that went on here, the next verse that is not on here. And <laughs> Do what? Play with pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, play with pain. Uh, well, I need to read that. Somebody read verse 7 for me, if you would. Oh, okay. Then, then David and Ab- uh, David said to Abathar, the priest, now this guy is the high priest over Israel. David goes to the priest, and he says to the priest, Am- uh, to Abathar, the priest, Amalek's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abathar brought the ephod to David. Don't you love it when you when they bring the ephod? <laughs> Four of you know what an ephod is. So. <laughs> so, so David went to the priest when he's going through something that's bigger than him. His world is collapsing. Everything is, he's lost his wives. He's lost his home. It, it's just like, I, I was thinking about it, it's comparative to, uh, to Maui right now. We, we, I told you last week, there's a family used to be in the church that have moved now. Maybe this was Wednesday night when I told it. Their son is one of the uh, emergency care people on the island over there. And out of 27 uh, responders, out of 29 responders, 27 of them lost their homes. And some of them family members. He was one of two that his home did not burn. But they're having to do what you, what you would have to do, John. They're having to serve these people while they have no home to go to. And it's tough. And so David is kind of in that situation. He's lost everything. And so he calls for the priest. So what David did when his circumstances went, went bad, when everything went south, is the first thing he did was he sought the Lord. I know you expect to hear this from the preacher. If you don't, you're in the wrong church. The first, first thing David did was he sought the Lord. But how did he seek the Lord? He called for Abithar, Abathar, the, the priest, to come, but 
he asked Avatar to do something. He said, bring me the E5. <laughs> now, the E5 was a garment. Some of you do know this. It was a garment that God had told Moses back in, in Exodus when he was telling Moses how to, how to build the tabernacle and all the articles of the tabernacle and utensils and the clothing and everything that was involved in it. He told Moses at that time to, to uh, make an ephod for Aaron and one for all of his sons. And the ephod was a garment that they would wear that had two onyx stones, one on each shoulder, large onyx stones that uh, had meaning and they had purpose and they carried them. They, they wore this garment. So the garment also was made of linen. And linen speaks of special things in the, in the Old Testament. I won't go into all that, but I'm going to touch on some others. But along with the linen, it had four things woven into it and patterns woven into it that God had, had, uh, had instructed Moses to do on the ephod. So the ephod had real gold threading. It had gold in the ephod that they would wear. It also had blue, a royal, bright royal blue threading and, and patterns. It had purple and it had red. Now, all four of these we understand today to have meaning. In the, in the new covenant, we can look back at the old covenant and see what things spoke of Christ who was to come. And that ephod speaks of Christ. The, uh, the gold is a, a material that was always given to kings. Gold speaks of kingship in the scripture. And we know Jesus would become the king of who? He's your king. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, Jesus was to become king. Come on, get with me now. Get with me. So they had gold. Let's hope you're going to get this in just a minute. So this garment had, it spoke of kingship. Next, it had blue. Blue in the scripture is typical of heaven and the heavenlies. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, when he ascended on high, he ascended into the heavenlies and he was seated at the right hand of the Father. So the blue speaks of the fact that Jesus is in heaven. Okay, so they had gold, they had blue, it had purple in it. Purple was for royalty, majesty, and uh and it spoke of spiritual leadership. And here's the thing about purple. To get true purple, they, uh, hardly anybody could own purple. Usually it was just uh, very, very extremely wealthy people or people who were in authority as a king or something of royalty. And the reason is because purple was taken from some type of a shell. It may be an oyster shell or something. But they would draw it out, a little draw, a little drop at a time. And it was such a minute amount that it barely even showed up when they would take this purple dye from this shell. And it would take as many as 10,000 shells to get enough purple dye to dye one garment. And so it was a, a purple garment was extremely expensive. And those in majestic positions and authority, kings and royalty, would wear purple robes. You remember when Jesus was crucified, they took a purple robe and put it on him to mock him. That's what they were doing. And so this garment, this ephod, had gold, it had blue, it had purple, and it had red. And we all know that in the Old Testament, in the Scripture, and even in the New Testament, we have what's called the scarlet thread that runs from, from Genesis chapter 3 all the way through the Bible, showing different places that blood was shed. And the shedding of that blood was God showing all through the Scripture, Old Testament, all the way through to the cross that he was going to save mankind by the shedding of blood and it's called the scarlet thread and so when David said not knowing really and truly why he said it but when David said bring me the ephod and Abithar, Abathar the, the priest went and got the ephod and brought, brought it now we don't know if David put the ephod on or if the priest got it and wore it into David's presence but this is what we know. David called for the ephod because David was distressed. And in his distress, in his brokenness, in his time of need, 
in this thing that he couldn't deal with, this sour life he was living, or whatever, you, however you would uh, equate this to your circumstance, in the midst of all of this trouble, David said, bring me the ephod. Now, now this is what we gain from that. The ephod was David's point of contact with God. Why would God have a garment that people had to put on for somebody to be able to get to him? It sounds ludicrous. And it is ludicrous. Unless you understand the base principle, which is called obedience. David didn't need to know why he was supposed to call for the ephod. He just knew Moses said, when you need something, call the priest. Go to the priest who has the ephod. He didn't know that the priest that he was going to by obeying God was not Abathar. I keep saying Abathar, it's Abathar. It was not Abathar, but it was Jesus in the heavenlies that that garment spoke of. It said, access the king to the king who's resident in the heavenlies, who is royalty, has all authority and power. Come on. Because he shed his blood for you. So David, just do what I'm telling you to do. You don't have to understand it. And this is where we get, we get whacked out. So when it comes to obeying God, you know, it, there's a lot of things we can think, well, I don't know why all I have to do that. I've had people say that to me as a pastor. Well, I just don't know why I have to do that. Well, don't then and see what happens. <laughs> You know, roll around in the highway and have fun. See what happens. But David knew that he needed to get a hold of God and to get an answer. So he went to Abathar and he said, bring me the ephod. Abathar knew what that meant. So he goes back to the, to the priestly closet, flips through, picks out the best ephod. Oh, yeah, clips that one on. And he comes out and he's wearing this ephod. Now, there was another thing that they did in the Old Testament called the Urim and the Thummim, that along with this ephod, there was a breastplate that they would wear over, and it had 12 stones. And they were different stones, very expensive stones and large stones, and they spoke of, they, they represented each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And without going into all that, so the priest would come out. You may have seen these drawings or sketches of what this priest would have looked like. He had a turban that he wore. There were other things that he wore. But he would carry two stones called the Urim and the Thummim. And there's a lot of question about these, what they really were, how they worked, and, and why God used them. But there's seven mentions in the Bible of the Urim and the Thummim. And some, some people would call them looking glasses. Uh, just, just weird stuff, you know? I mean, just weird stuff. And so you would go to a priest, and you'd say, I need, I need an answer. The kings would go to the priest many times and say, I'm fixing to go to battle. Should I go to battle, or should I not go to battle? And they would put, put on the ephod, pull out the Urim and the Thummim, and hold them. And it's believed, because there's no true written explanation of how the Urim and the Thummim worked, but it's believed that they would glow to answer the question. Should I go to battle? Maybe it would have been like the right stone would glow and not the left. Should he stay home? Well, it might be the left one that glowed. Isn't this the coolest thing? I mean, it sounds like craziness, but it was God giving all this pictorial, uh, how do I even put it? The, the, Paul, Paul put it this way in the, in the New Testament. He spoke about the Old Testament. He said, all the things that are written in the Old Testament are in samples for you. That's the word they use, in samples. We call it examples today. They were in samples for us today that we can look back at those things and we can learn about God and Jesus in the New Testament. They all spoke of Christ. When Jesus was walking down the road to Emmaus after he had died and resurrected, he's walking down the road going to a town called Emmaus. There's two men walking along. These two men are talking. And they're saying, we really thought this Jesus was going to be the king. We thought he was going to be the Messiah. Now he's dead. We're disappointed. We don't understand. And Jesus sees them walking and talking, and he runs up and catches up with them. He said, hey, hey, guys, let me talk to you all. And the Bible says he taught them all things about himself, beginning with the law and the prophets. That's what Moses wrote, the first five 
first five books of the Pentateuch, and the prophets is your minor prophets and your major prophets on off into the latter part of the, of the Old Testament. So Jesus said, or the scripture said that Jesus taught those two men all things about himself from the Old Testament. So don't ever let a good church of Christ person tell you the Old Testament's not important. It is the revelation of Jesus. And you got to go back there and you got to get into that and look at all that. So David just obeys. And that's what they were to do in the Old Testament. They didn't have this understanding. They didn't have the enlightenment. They didn't know the tabernacle exemplified Jesus. They didn't know the Urim and the Thummim. They didn't know any of this stuff. They just knew they were told what to do. And if they did it, guess what? God honored the obedience and he showed up. And so David said, bring me the ephod. They brought the ephod and David said, to the priest, shall I go up? Shall we go after these? Will we overthrow them? Will we conquer them? Will we get back what was lost? And the priest says, from whatever God spoke to him, he relayed the message back, and he said, go up, you'll, you'll take them. Okay, so that's, that's pretty cool. Everybody say amen to that. Amen. One last point I want to make is this. That priest, Abathar, with the ephod, stood as the mediator between David and God. It, in, the, in the Old Testament, you had to go to the priest. Today, the Catholics still think that. They still believe that to some degree, depending on which Catholic church you, you attend from what I understand. They still believe you need to go through a priest to have whatever. That's taken from the Old Testament. There had to be a mediator between man and God. And the priests in that day were the mediator. The prophets were the voice of God speaking to mankind. But the priests came before, were there for men to come to, so men could go to, so the priests could go to God on their behalf, and then God would relay back to them. And so, so the and this is the point that we need to get. And I'm, I know you understand this. You're, you're head on me already because you're very smart people. <laughs> the Bible says in the New Testament that Jesus is the mediator between God and man. So Je those gar that garment, all of that, spoke of Jesus being our mediator. When we are going through something difficult, it's not in our human nature to look to our mediator to go to God to get us help. It's in our human nature to try to figure this thing out and make it work ourselves. I'm going to figure this out. I can do it, especially men. We're worse than everything. Women are more spiritually attuned and sensitive typically to the, to the things of God than, the, than men are. That's just a fact. Men are dumb, I guess, spiritually. But uh, women are much quicker to say, well, let's pray. Let's, you know, women, I've always got to kick out of this too as long as I've been pastoring. Poor, you poor wives, every one of y'all are upset that your husbands don't lead you. Listen, he's leading you in the way God called him. Just work with that. <laughs> Just go with that, you know. Uh, but, you, but you ladies, you have more of a sensitivity to the spirit than most men do. You know, occasionally you'll find that Scott Pugh who's really sensitive and cries when the Holy Spirit comes on him all the time. God bless him. He, he's very sensitive to the Lord. Most of us men are hard heads and but doesn't mean we're not hearing from God. We just ain't hearing like you hear. You hear with your feeler. We hear with our thinker. Or, but you know, I mean, it's, so anyway, go on, Daryl. Get this up. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, I need to get through this and let y'all go home. So here's the point. So when you're going through a difficult situation, Dave, do what David did. David sought the Lord, right? Uh, so here are four easy steps. I'm going to make them quick to sweetening your bitter waters. Okay, you're going through something, you're living in something that you can't deal with. It's tough. It's causing long suffering. You'd like to just get out of it. I remember when I when I first went to work for Central Freight Lines, Lori and I had just gotten married. I had a job at a pizza place at college. That's where we met. Well, that's kind of the first time I saw her. And, and long story. Anyway, we got we were about to get married and I knew I had to have a real job and I found out about this job loading trucks at Central Freight Lines. And very hard work, labor, hard physical labor. But I was excited about it because it paid $7 an hour. Yeah. Now, in that day, minimum wage was like $1.69. So now you remember. Those of you that are old, the rest of you understand now. So this was a killer job. And I was so excited. And I went to work three months before we married. 
and I'm killing it, man. I'm banking, banking over $300 a week and uh, putting money in, in a, in a, in a uh, retirement account, putting a little money in a, in a credit union, and still got money to play with and bought a new car, and everything's great. And I've been there about three weeks, and I figured out this, this, this is a work. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't so fun after all. And I stayed there for a total of about seven years, and I hated six and a half of those years. <laughs> no, I did uh, but it was very difficult. I didn't want to be there because I knew God had called me to preach. And why am I loading trucks? And this is so difficult. This is not what I want to do with my life. And it got to the point. At one point, I literally was t- 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 pouring my heart out to Lori. We were young. And I remember crying and saying, I just, I don't know what, I can't do this. I'm supposed to be in the ministry. This is killing me. And I'd go to work and I hated it. But there came a point to where God gave me, and, and I, I won't say it came as light. No, oh, I changed my life. But I grew into this. When I learned that that job, that making money was not my purpose for being there. My purpose for being there was to minister and do what he had called me to do. He didn't say, initially, on you're going to preach from the pulpit, although that's what I wanted. He said, I'm calling you to preach. Well, why I got to wait for a pulpit? <laughs> right? So... So I turned that job into my church and started leading people to the Lord. Prayed for my supervisor on a break, a 15-minute break. And he got baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues in 15 minutes. And he was Southern Baptist. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and when I learned to, take, to turn that into what, it didn't take away the difficulty and the struggle and the and, of dealing with what I still wanted to do passionately as pastor of church and pastor sheep. It didn't, it didn't rectify all of that, but it brought me purpose for being there, which made sense, and I, it was like putting sugar in my lemon, sweetening the lemonade. So, here you go, number one. Focus on the good that you do have in your life already. Whatever you're going through is tough, and it's bad, and it's hard. But there's some good stuff in your life. Focus on that. Look at the good people God has put in your life and how, what a blessing they are to you. Be appreciative. Start thinking about other people and quit thinking about yourself. Make it your goal to please someone else, not to get pleased. Examine yourself. I love, I love the scripture Paul said. Let us therefore examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. We might be fooling ourselves. How can you examine yourself? I'll tell you one way you can examine your heart to see if you are in the faith. And this is it. If you're not doing anything to love and help and support and serve and be there and be encouraging to other people, something huge is missing in you. Because that's who God is. That's who he is. And if he's in us, that's what's going to come out. Encouragement, help, strength, support. And uh, so focus on the good that you do have. Second thing, renew your determination to try again. With, with a lot of stress and a long time, some things we go through just don't seem to ever let up. And some of them are not going to let up to the day you die. And I hate to say that. There are some things that you'll go through in life that are going to be hard until the end of your life. I know that ain't practical, charismatic preaching, but that's the truth. There are some things that are going to be hard. And so, in those things, renew your determination to try again with patience because you don't know which is going to prosper. So, there's a verse in the book of Ecclesiastes that said this, Sow your seed in the morning. And sow in the evening. It's talking about planting seeds. Sow in the morning and sow in the evening. Now watch this. He says, for and we've been taught whatever you sow, you whatever you sow, you reap, right? Now that's there's another context of that. But we've been taught, hey, if you plant a hundred dollar bill, you're gonna reap a ten, you know, hundredfold, ten thousand dollars. But listen to what the Bible says. Sow your seed both in the morning and in the evening. For you do not know which will prosper. Either that or this or neither. That's like, who put that in the Bible? It's been a, Lori and I have been trying to become gardeners for the last four years. I'm sowing seed and it's dying. 
so disappointing. I, my strawberry bush got this big this year. It had five strawberries that the rabbits ate. So what do you do? Renew your determination to try again, even when you think you can't do it anymore. Keep trying. Keep working. Do it with patience. Number, number, number three, believe that God has something more down the road if you remain faithful and you faint not. Scripture says that, that uh, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you don't faint. Keep trying. Don't give up. Keep sticking in there. Keep keep. Forcing, for, pushing yourself forward. Uh, Jeremiah 10, 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Now, what he said is this. God says, I'm testing a, te us. I, I test you. I try your, your thoughts. I try. You. And he said, I'm watching your ways to see, to see what you're going to do for it. Even to give every man according to his ways. We want something more than be faithful where you're at. God is watching. He wants to give you more, but it's going to be according to your ways and my ways and according to the fruit of his doings. You can't keep doing the wrong thing and think you're going to get the right response. He, God, God says, I want to bless you, but you can't keep doing stupid. Come on. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. And the last, last point I want to make, this is a text that I have talked about numerous times over the years because I love it so much. And I, I'm just going to tell this story real quick. But the last thing you need to do is you've got to put sweetener in your lemonade. So you, you, you're a believer. You've got a sour situation you're in. You're, you're trying to come to church and be faithful and hear the word, and you're praying, and, and you're seeking God. You're trying, to, you're trying to put the water of the word in your circumstance, but it's still bitter. It's still difficult, and, and you need some sweetener to put in there. So what is the sweetener that you can put in your sour situation? And uh, so the story is, and I, this is one that I use a lot, when the children of Israel came out of, out of the, they crossed the Red Sea, they came over there rejoicing, they're shouting. Miriam takes up a tambourine, leads over a million women dancing and praising God. And she sings this awesome song that comes from her spirit. She writes a song, if you will. Everybody's pumped. They're on fire. The church is fired up. Things are great. God's just opened the Red Sea for us and took away all of Pharaoh and washed them downstream. Life is good from here on out. And then it says, and three days later, they came to a place called Mara in the desert. Now, Mara means bitter. And the reason they named it Mara, they named it Mara. The reason they named it Mara was because it was a place where there was water. They had gotten, they've been three days in the wilderness, and they're starting to run out of water. And they're all upset. And they're all frantic. -y, and they're all of a sudden, they come to this, this, this uh, mirage, almost, not a mirage. What do you call it when it's just a, uh, the, the actual pond in it? come to an oasis and it, water everybody drops all of their equipment they're running they you know they bend over they start lapping the water and then the water is bitter which means it's poison if they drink it it'll kill them so they start spitting it all out and they're like this is ridiculous you know god and then they turn around and what do they do they blame moses why did you bring us into this wait 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 two days ago y'all shouting praises but now things aren't going well, and now it's all Moses' fault. Why'd you bring us out here to let us die in the wilderness? And, uh, and so, what did Moses do? And Moses cried out to the Lord. He sought the Lord. Same thing David did. Did a little different. They didn't have the ephod yet, so Moses cried out to the Lord. And get what, get, this is the coolest thing to me. I just love this. They're in the wilderness. Life is hard. No water. We're going to die. Why'd you bring us out here? Ah, there's an oasis. The oasis is better. God, you're just being mean to me. You're just picking on me. You just keep taking me from one bad situation to another bad situation. Nothing ever changes for me. And here you are. 
And then Moses gets the blame, the guy at the top, and he turns around and he cries out to the Lord. And this is what it says. And the Lord showed him a tree. The Lord showed him a tree. Now, you're in the wilderness where there are no trees. And there's really no water. But God brought them to water, and it just had to be bitter water. And there's one tree standing off to the side. This roots have probably been drawing from this water, and it's, it's working okay. Here's this tree. The Lord showed him a tree. Well, whoop de doo But he said to him, cut the tree down and throw the tree in the water. Well, that's kind of dumb, Lord. Moses, cut the tree down and throw it in the water. And so he cut the tree down and he threw it in the water. And the Bible says, and the waters, watch this, were sweetened. That's the word. And the waters were sweetened. The bitterness in the water was turned to sweetness. And after they all jumped in and just lapped up and drank and filled up their water, water tanks for the next journey, rest, after they, man, they had more water. It was great. It was, they were refreshed. Then they left from there. They went to, I think it was Edom or, I don't remember. They went to another place. And, and, and when they got there, there were 70 palm trees and 12 springs of water. Because Moses cut the tree down and threw it in the water. Now, what does a tree represent in the Old Testament, speaking of the New Testament? Come on. Huh? Trees do speak of life. They do. But they speak of the cross. So here they are in the wilderness, lost and dying, incapable of of drinking of the water of the word until the cross is applied to their life. And so God said, take the cross and put it in your circumstance. Now, what does that mean? That means look upon his suffering. He suffered for us far more than we're suffering in our little situation today, even though it may be a great situation. But he suffered for us far more than we will ever suffer. And if we will take his suffering and put it into our situation, it will sweeten our waters. And I mean, I mean, I'll say it this way, and I am winding down again. Look at what he went through. And from the bottom of your heart, examine your life and just say, God, I want to make everything in my life I want to build everything in my life. I want to build around you. I want to build around you. If you bring Jesus into your circumstance, he will sweeten it. Call for the ephod, and you have access with the Father, and he'll help you. Amen? All right. I'm supposed to read this, and then I'm going to quit. Here we go. Is it the devil, that old Amalekite, that is stolen from you, and you're so distressed that you can't move forward now? Is it the loss of a relationship that's breaking your heart? Separation from those you love can be unbearable at times. Are you grieving or struggling with letting go after a divorce or a death of a loved one? Or after someone hurt you deeply and is still there in your heart. Again, maybe the devil has burned up everything you've ever built. You're going through bankruptcy. Your business is closing. Or your family's falling apart. Or your health is failing. And the thought of building back is beyond your reach. And in some situations, that, that can be that difficulty. If you're going through those things... You just need to go to Jesus. Invite him. Call for the ephod. And you'll have access with the Father, and the Father will help you in your situation.
Stand up if you will, and let's pray. God wants to help us. <laughs> There's some of you in here that I know your situations, and I know the difficulty that you're going through. And, uh, and it can make you bitter if you let it. Or it can make you, as the old saying goes, it can make you better if you let it. So let's just, uh, just close our eyes for just a moment. And just think through your heart, your life, and what you might be dealing with in your life. If, if there's something that you're going through that is, that is this difficult, that you just can't get through it, you can't imagine building back, you can't imagine forgiving, you can't imagine overcoming, you can't imagine things getting better. God wants you to know that he cares for you. And part of sending Jesus to die for us on the cross was to restore everything the canker worm had stolen. That was part of the purpose. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have that more abundantly. That's what he has for us is abundance of life. He wants to restore everything the enemy's taken. Whatever the old Amalekite has taken from you, God says, go get it and bring it back. Go get it and bring it back. And so, Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that we would all take this, this uh, example, these examples from, from your word, and that's the water of the word. Lord, that we would allow the sour situations that we're dealing with to be saturated by the word that you spoke to us today. And then we will look to Jesus, look to the cross, and let you sweeten the waters so that we don't have to struggle with this, but you can empower us and give us grace and strength to get through it while we know that you're going to change it in your time and in your way. Lord, we just rest in you. We rely upon you. We put our trust in you, and we believe you're here to help us. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask a question before we go. If there's anyone here...